you, Michael. All right, good. And we were recording. And again, welcome to the October 7th Village of Woodbury Planning Board meeting. All right. Um, has everybody had a chance to look at the September meeting of the September 2nd minutes? I have one question, Chris. Yep. On page six, uh, Woodbury Villas, uh, second paragraph. Okay. It says, as noted in our memorandum dated August 28th, uh, a revised site plan should be provided. Um, is that correct? Because I didn't receive anything. I don't, I'm not sure that's what we said. And two, um, in that same letter by Dennis on August 28th, I asked the question, he stated 451 lots, but yet there's only 426 on the map. He gave a good response. I just don't see it in the minutes. All right, I'm sure we can have Claudia can go back and okay. amend, amend that for us. But there is no revised site plan, as it says on. No, I don't, I don't believe so. No. Okay, I just want to make sure because I didn't receive anything. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on those minutes? We're doing the September second minutes, Sandy. I know you just got kicked out and kicked back in. Okay. All right. So, uh, on I'll make I'll offer a motion to accept the uh, accept the minutes, and then we'll just have Claudia look at that uh, that one line and make it. To be okay, I second it. Okay, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. All right, first my uh, item on the agenda this, this evening: timely signs, Heritage Financial uh, review application received for ARB of proposed color and size, size and size signage change for Heritage Financial Credit Union, located in Strip Mall at 273 Route 32 in Central Valley. Said property is known on the Village of Woodbury tax maps as section 230, block four, lot 4.1. I thought I saw Heritage Financial sign in. Who is representing Heritage Financial tonight? Anybody here representing Heritage Financial tonight? I do see them on the screen. There's a yeah. box labeled Heritage Financial. Yeah. But they are not connected to audio. Let me see if I can send them a chat message. Stand by. Let me send them a chat. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but there's an echo. Okay, is this better? Yes. Okay. Yes, my name is, uh, I'm, I'm Robert Rossini. I am the Senior Director of Marketing for Heritage Financial. Okay. Can you just give us a brief overview of uh, what brings you in front of the board tonight, please? Sure. So today we're looking to see if we can have a variance approved for our sign, which is at 273 Route 32 in the plaza. Um, we've recently changed our name from Hudson Heritage Credit Union to Heritage Financial. In doing so, we've actually uh, changed our logo as well as changed our colors from a royal blue to a navy blue. So we're looking to see if we can get the color approved so we can have the color of our brand within the sign above our storefront as well as within the plaza sign as well into a navy blue versus a royal blue. The second piece of that variance was to see if we can increase the size of our store or our, our sign above the storefront since we are occupying two spaces versus the one space that, that the other occupants are, are occupying now. So we're trying to see if we can do both. Um, like I said, the navy blue um, instead of the royal blue, as well as increase the sign sign uh, size. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I'll Thank go you, to Dennis. Well, um, okay. 
this is very similar to the Bagel World application that you had not too long ago where they wanted to do some branding and they had a, a blue and white sign, which was the sign of color for every store in the uh, Central Valley Mini Mall. And they were looking for a different color and the board reviewed that carefully and then authorized the change. This is similar to that, but there are a couple of things that we need to understand. First up, it's, I don't think there are variances necessarily here. I think what you're looking for from the planning board is architectural review board approval. And I don't know that this is a site plan. I think it's just ARB approval. But uh, you've you mentioned something about changing the size of the sign. The signs up there, for, it looks like for the, the last one we had, Bagel World, was 24 inches by 96. I think it was, uh, yeah, it was um, two feet by eight feet. Um, the sign that we got the materials on recently for yours was noted as a 30 inch by 90 inch sign, which is larger in square footage than the bagel wheel sign. Are you looking to go larger than that still? And uh, Chris, you're gonna have to unmute Heritage if they're gonna respond there if you can. I just wanna know if you're, what size you're looking for. Yes, it, it, the size that's in the application, so you're correct there um, on the 90, I believe it was 90 by 30. Um, that is the size that's uh, that's in the application and the reason, you know, we put forward the reason as, you know, we do occupy two storefronts versus the um, the single storefront that the other occupants do do show. So that's why we're looking to obviously increase our branding, increase our um, visibility from the road. I'm still trying to understand this because what I saw was the existing sign is 30 by 90 for your store. And the one you're proposing is 30 by 90. It may be larger than the others, but if it's the same one and the same size and you're not changing anything, I don't think you necessarily need to ask for any kind of relief or any further approval from the board in terms of size. But is, is it your understanding that 30 by 90 is larger than what's there or your understanding that you're going to actually make it larger than the 30 by 90 that's there? It's our understanding, um, and I don't know if Joe Bikert is on the phone um, because he is the actual um, gentleman from Timely Signs, but it is our understanding that is an, it's an increase in size of signage uh, from what we have now. So it's a, it's a variation from what we have now in terms of the size of the sign. Not right, on well, the, yep. Not the board on the is actual, limited to 20 square feet unless you do go to a variance, and that would be a different board and a, and a a longer time for you. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if you can make the representation to the board that it will not be larger than 20 square feet, and then it's properly before this board. And then the second thing is the board's gonna need to know what they're approving. Um, it can't be just a larger sign. It's gotta be certain dimensions, uh, whatever that might be, so the board knows what they're acting on. There, uh, Dennis, there was, I think, an email from Timely Signs that came over late, late today um that we haven't you at your office hasn't had a chance or this board hasn't had a chance to review you i took a look at that and that's from what i saw on there it said new sign 30 by by 90. 90. yeah yeah that's what it yeah well it also <clears throat> says in the application that i thought that the existing sign was 30 by 90. that's what i'm trying to get my hands around we had asked in our memo for measurements of the existing signs and the proposed signs, which, which is, you know, obviously what's missing here. Understandable. I'm, I'm trying to text our, our um, timely signs gentleman right now, because he should be on the line to be able to provide that information. And these memos would have been sent over to you and uh, you should forward them over to timely sign if they can't get onto the call tonight for whatever reason, so that they can answer the consultant's question. Because uh, we're going to need that information in order to move the application. Uh, I'm looking at the drawings that they submitted today. And one says existing conditions exterior. And it says single sided roof mounted sign cabinet, 30 inches high by 90 inches uh, overall. All right. Then on the sign with the new colors, the one they're proposing, it says 30 inch high by 90 inch wide roof mounted sign. Under those circumstances, there wouldn't be any change, but I, I don't want to presume for the applicant. So they'll just have to clarify, and it's important, and that's why I mentioned it up front. Uh, it's a threshold issue to make sure that it's properly before this board, 
uh, and that you can take action and you know what they're asking you to approve. So that is an important issue. I'll move on to a couple other small comments that I have on this. And, but uh, the fundamental thing right now is to understand what size sign they're looking for. Okay, so um, it's straightforward. They've, sh they've shown you now, they gave you a picture of the colors and what they want to do with that sign. It's obviously changing away from the blue that it is now uh, to a different blue with, um, uh, with another color, I forget what, tan, I guess it is. Yeah, with the navy blue and tan. Um, and the only other, th and so that's within the discretion of the board. The only other thing that I have is that the multi-tenant sign, the small sign that's located along 32 in the front, uh, from the original, original materials received, we thought there was no change to the multi-tenant sign. In the materials they sent today, they show that they're gonna take the little slot that they have in there now with the navy blue color on and change that out to the um, new sign color and their new name. Um, and the only thing I'll note for you, that's totally within your discretion if you wish to allow that. But when you reviewed the bagel uh, world, for some reason, uh, although you changed the wall sign, you didn't want to change the, um, the little placard out of the multi-tenant sign. And so it did not change for Bagel World. And that's all I have, unless you have any questions on the report we circulated. Does anybody have any questions for Dennis? Mm -mm. All right, Jonathan. Um, when I prepared my memo for the board, it's my practice, I also send it to the applicants. Uh, so the gentleman from Timely Sign did receive my memo and uh, he emailed me and said he, uh, uh, you know, would provide more information. Uh, and obviously he did uh, to you, but I, I didn't receive that today. But it sounds like this is a good start. I mean, obviously we, as long as we know that it's code compliant and we have accurate information on what's being proposed, uh, that's all I was I was looking for in terms of the substance of what they're asking for. I think it's pretty reasonable, and the b board should give its opinion on the uh, on the colors. But you've already have a precedent with Bagel World of di of diverging from the standard blue color scheme throughout. Anybody have any questions for Jonathan? Um, okay. I will for the for the applicant. We did uh, typically this board doesn't look at information that is received the day of the meeting. Uh, we ask stuff be submitted two weeks prior to the upcoming meeting so that the board and the consultants have time to properly review. Um, but what I will say is looking at the documentation uh, that was sent to us late this afternoon, um, the colors uh, aren't accurately. Re I don't feel are accurately representative. It almost looks black in the email, uh, like a black on white with a tan sign. Um, so being we do need some confirmation before we can move the application forward, um, maybe um, the PDF that gets sent to the building department, we could check uh, how that was sent over and maybe make sure the colors are a little bit easier to understand or, or show a little bit better next time they're sent over to us for the for review. Yeah, and we can send over um, whatever you need. The I, I just got off the phone with the vendor. It is the proposed size, and uh, for some reason he thought that he sent this over, but was three feet by ten and a half feet. Well, that's that's larger. Than Thirty-six than by one twenty-six. Yes. Thirty-six by one twenty-six. So they would have to go to the ZBA, right? Because that's going to be over the. Square footage. That's 31 and a half square feet. And my, I'd have to look back, but uh, our, in our memo, I think we said 20 square feet was the uh, max. The code yeah. permits all signs of up to 20 square feet. Yeah. And it, it really isn't keyed to the, the to the uh, width of the tenants uh, holding in the shopping center or that you have a so called so double unit or anything like that. It's, it's just 20 square feet. Right, that's just the, the our, our our sign code in Woodbury. So if the applicant, Rick, uh, keep me straight here. If the if the applicant does want to go with that dimension, then their next step would be to file an application with the ZBA, right? Because they're going to need a variance. Well, we if can't. if in, and I think we have to confirm that. I, I I think Dennis was saying he still need to confirm it. it. If in fact it is 20 feet as the maximum, and they want some 30 odd square feet 
then yes, they need a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals and they need to get file that application with the building department. And really you should wait until um, the ZBA rules to see whether or not you do it. Um, I do have a couple of uh, minor points, one of which is with respect to the color. Um, the applicant should actually provide color chips uh, and enough copies so that each of the board can get it since it's not easily reproducible. So if you could say do um, eight um, color chips for the two colors um, that can be distributed among the planning board and consultants, that would be helpful. Um, the, just moving forward, it's a, under seeker, it's a type two action. Um, and no GML referrals are required, but a public hearing would be required here. There would also be a separate public hearing if they're going for a variance, the larger sign, before the ZBA. So they may have two public hearings, but that's what's required by the code. The other thing that you may want to uh, address with the applicant, because I don't think it was very clear, is actually the placement of the sign. And I think Jonathan may have been getting to this a little bit, is that not only do you need to know the size of it, but you don't want it placed on the building and such, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their offices such that it's uh, off-centered in a way that looks odd or something like that. So they should provide some kind of um, simple rendering as to the exact placement of the sign. That will also help Gary with respect to enforcement of anything that's approved by you. Okay. Yeah, we had asked in our memo for a mock-up of the of the roof showing all the four signs, one sort of a, a simulation, and it when I saw it flash by from Chris's computer before, I th it looks like they did that step. It's just that it's it was unclear what size each one was. But I, I don't think that it's clear from what they submitted this afternoon exactly where they want to put the sign, especially since it's a larger sign than what is right. there. I don't know if they want to have that off-centered or something, but they need to make it clear so that the board can understand what's going to end up there. If, if it is a larger sign uh, and you show it on the facade, it has to be in proportion and to scale so that the board can get the dimensions of how that sign appears in that space. Thank you, Rick, Dennis, Jonathan. Uh, and I think Dennis, you had, we need the LLC for, uh, Rick, we need the LLC form too, right? Yes. And I think, um, I'm not sure who owns this. There's, right now, th there's a new, um, as I'm sure everybody here knows, there's a new um, entity disclosure form that was required by the Board of Trustees as of August of this year. Um, but it's for, right now the form is really geared toward applicants rather than owners. So the older form is the one that the owner, if they're an entity, has to fill out and they have to fill out the newer form for the applicant if they are not an individual person. So they can work through the building department with, for that. Thank you, Thank you Rick. I can't remember his name tonight. Uh, any members of the board uh, have any other questions for this applicant? I do, Chris. Go ahead, Jenny. Um, just so the applicant does want to change the directional sign or the, the placard with the listing sign on the, um, on route 32. And the multi-tenant sign. Right. Is that is as far as the colors, it doesn't exceed the colors where that's going to need a variance as well. Right. Every sign, uh, the maximum number is four colors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you'd call the multi-tenant sign one sign or um, a multitude of individual signs. <laughs> I might have to have Gary talk to us about that one. But if you look at their particular placard that would go in there, it wouldn't. Uh, it's only a couple of colors. Okay. It appears to be less than four. Okay. I do, Sandy. I do know Bagel World did change theirs though, so they're back to the. Right. They yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Anybody else have any questions for this applicant? I do. Um, am, I, am I muted or not? No, you're good. No, no, you're you're good. Yeah, right. yeah, I muted it because my clocks were going off. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether this uh, sign that's proposed is illuminated from within or is it going to have a spotlight on it? 
It would be the current uh, format right now. So it's not illuminated currently right now. So we would keep it the same way as what we had previously. All right. So you have a, uh, a light shining on it to illuminate it from outside. Correct. So it would be okay. the same. We'd be proposing the same. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Any other questions yeah. from the board? All right. Um, all right. Well, thank you for you. You got some homework. Um, are you you kind of understand where you need to go next with this? Yes, I think we understand where we need to go. So next steps for us is I'll, I'll work with our sign vendor. We'll get some you know real mockups. This way we can see you know how that would look to scale um, everything along those lines, and this way we can proceed with um, with that back to the board here. Okay. And again, make sure you confirm. The size, because if you're going with that larger size, you're going to need to go to a different board uh, to get the variance. So, understandable. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for your time this evening. Thanks. All right. Next item on the agenda this evening is Woodbury Villas discuss the review of propose the proposed site plan amendment to the phasing plan for a 21 lot transfer from phase one to phase six. Said subdivision is located off Dundenberg Road and is known as the Village of Woodbury tax maps as section 225 block one lot 3.222 at all. All right, I think I saw Mr. Boat first off. Oh, there you are. Okay, good evening. Good evening, uh, everybody. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, because I'm not in my normal location um, I, so I hope there's no background noise. Uh, so uh, to first, I believe from the memo that Dennis sent around, and I agree with this, uh, there doesn't seem to be any action that needs to be taken regarding uh, the other application that the, the traffic light is in. And I think we all agree that nothing need be done. So I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record. So there was no uh, ambiguity about that or people didn't think it was a loose end. So Steve, so just for the record, to make it clear, so you're withdrawing that part of the application, is that correct? That's correct. It, it's moot. It, let's put it this way. It's, it's moot now. Um, now, as far as the uh, switch in the phases is concerned, uh, saw Dennis's memo, which I, I think basically is sort of in two parts. Um, one is the actual switching of the phasing, and the other is, well, what's going to happen with the rest of uh, phase one, uh, which I think is probably where the board is going to have most of its questions. So let me uh, perhaps throw out an idea that might be something that could be workable for everybody. Um, uh, we've discussed this, uh, discussed this with uh, my client uh, at some length. And uh, as we understand it, the clubhouse has already received your approval, received ARB approval. And what would need to be done is there would need to be a building permit that would need to be obtained. Uh, we're prepared to do that uh, within the next 30 to 45 days and then begin construction as soon as possible thereafter. I really only issue is weather. Um, since it'll, it might be coming, uh, how much work we can do uh, before the uh, cold weather comes. Um, and the commitment will be to construct that uh, with due diligence, meaning we'll keep on going until it's completed. Uh, so we're not looking to delay that or get into some kind of an issue about it. Honestly, um, there was not an understanding on my client's end uh, that this needed to be done before other parts of phase one, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're not looking to debate that issue. Uh, we're happy to turn around and uh, construct the uh, clubhouse and get it going. The only thing that is a concern is um, we can't await the completion of that to be able to continue to construct um, other homes. Uh, that would basically put this project at a halt, and that would create a very serious problem. Um, so in order to provide some comfort uh, that this is, uh, we mean what we say, that it's going to be built and built with due diligence, if this is of concern to the board, then um, we can bond it. 
and give the board the comfort and security to know that if we don't proceed in due diligence, the bond is there and the, it can be completed uh, even if my client is not willing to or able to continue. Uh, we don't see that as an obstacle to, uh, to going forward. So the idea would be that uh, if this is a concern, and I suspect it will be, um, we will take care of it, move with due diligence, uh, get the building permit ASAP and begin construction as soon as possible, go carry on through to completion. And the only thing that we would ask is as long as we're moving with due diligence, that we not be held up on building permits or certificates of occupancy. Thank you, sir. And then, of course, you know, we're looking to ask you uh, to approve the switch in the phase uh, phasing for the for the ones that there are complete or are just about to be complete. They've been under construction or completed uh, for some time now. Um, thank you. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Let me go to Dennis first, just to keep our normal uh, mode of operation going. Well, I'm, I'm going to put aside all the things that we had in the memo on the 30 COs and the traffic signal because that uh, that's moved at this point. The other items, I mean, um, what we heard tonight was that, um, and what I've written to you, is about our concern about getting in the same situation that we got into with the traffic signal with people having building permits, uh, having uh, houses built, and not being able to get COs. It's not good for the developer and it's not good for the municipality. Uh, they proposed something new, which I haven't heard before, and that's to bond it. Frankly, I've done a lot of bonding. Um, it used to be the way to do things. We bonded right from the very beginning and houses would start construction with the roads. Did a lot of that in New Jersey. Um, problem was after 2008, it got hard for developers to get bonds. And, and we saw different things happen. And in Woodbury for a long time, uh, you had to build the infrastructure before you were allowed to build, even start the first house. So that's the, when I came to town, it wasn't the village, the town, that's the way it was done. But even the bonding, all the bonding I've done has always been on infrastructure, roads, curbs, mostly not those, it's mostly top course of pavement. But in one shape or form, it's been infrastructure. This is an amenity. I, um, the municipality is not generally in the practice of building houses or clubhouses and that sort of thing. Just like when, when there's a, um, a large site plan uh, for uh, Cabela's or for a Woodbury Common, we take a restoration bond only to secure the site because you're not in the business of building malls and it would be difficult to take over. So I'm not saying this is a mall, but it's certainly not infrastructure like a road or that sort of thing. Um, it's unique, and so I really don't have an answer for you on that. <laughs> I mean, I guess someone could develop a bond, but um, um, it's different. So uh, I really don't have any way of answering that. I haven't done that in the past. Dennis? Um, yes. Um, to me, it would simply be similar to a performance bond that we would have on any type of uh, municipal project, including municipal buildings, where you'd have a performance bond in which if they fail to completed in a way under the conditions of the bond, um, then you would call on the performance bond who would then try to get a performance contractor. And if not, then the municipality would be able to hire a, um, a contractor to go ahead and, and uh, complete the work. I can see the parallels. It's just a little bit different. I know that when we're doing municipal work and I've done pump stations and I've done things for municipal buildings, not all municipal buildings, but additions, yeah, we've had performance bonds and I've had a call a bond, not for that, but for infrastructure. And usually it's just a bonding company that comes in and they hire a contractor. And um, unbelievable as it may sound, sometimes it's the same contractor that just defaulted and had that happen a couple of times. So um, yeah, if, if Ricky, if you're comfortable with that from a performance bond standpoint, we can do that then. then as long as there's sufficient something. protections in place and we can work on those. But yes, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that format to go ahead and, and uh, have that as to be security for the timely completion of the clubhouse. Okay, but the principal point for me to the board and uh, from the billing department as well is to not allow ourselves to get in the situation we got in before 
with homes built with no security and with um, an extended periods of time. Now, uh, it, when I've called a bond before, it doesn't happen easy. It's not easy. Uh, the bonding company is always, well, I, I won't say always, my experience has been difficult. Um, and so I just, I just note that, um, that it can be a difficult at times. And what's going to happen, let's just take this to its logical movement. A bond is issued, the clubhouse starts, but the houses move faster, which I might expect. Uh, there's, there might be an emphasis on houses and closing houses, which is where the cash flow is and not necessarily in the clubhouse. Not that this is with, they're disingenuous, it's just the way things are. And um, we end up down the road, a lot of building permits are being issued, a lot of CEOs are being issued and the clubhouse is not quite ready yet. Um, so at what point do we pull the trigger, call the bond? I mean, all those things need to be addressed. Yeah, I think those are the particulars I was talking about. Um, okay. but um, I, I know that in some fashion, it may look like um, it, you know, contractors go ahead and just default willy nilly and allow the performance bond to go forward. But, and this is speaking as a prior in house counsel for a large construction company, that it's really not done lightly to go ahead and default on a bond because it affects that contractor who is ever putting up the bond for a very long time as to their bonding capabilities going forward. But there's no doubt that it's not something that happens quickly. Um, so I don't think that people should understand this to mean that um, if they miss a, the milestone that we set for it, that uh, you know, three days later, there's a new crew on there finishing up the work. It, it takes a while. And if it ever gets challenged, there could be litigation involved. But we uh, could put some protections in place, including the fact that if there is litigation, that the applicant would have to pay for the village's uh, litigation fees. And if it um, had to do with a challenge to the performance bond. But I'd, I think that there can be reasonable conditions put in place with respect to the performance bond. What it would do, um, I think, is allay the fears that um, whether or not they didn't think it was their intention uh, to go ahead and just postpone this indefinitely is the, the concern was that it would be postponed indefinitely and possibly the very last thing on the project and then the developer would walk and it would never be built. Um, at least with a performance bond, um, you have that ability, even though it may take a little longer, that eventually it would be built and it would be built with the applicant's money. Okay, if that's going to be uh, some way of moving forward on this thing, I think that those things that you talked about, Rick, and the things that the board would want to see about how, because we're talking about the protections down the line. Nobody wants to see those protections in force to have a bond call or anything like that. Right. It's a matter of getting it built and getting it built in a timely manner. So I think that maybe some schedule should be established with building permits, not stopping the job, but reasonable triggers to, to look at this thing and to see how far the clubhouse is going in comparison to the other work and to see that there is a schedule that's established that provides for a reasonable uh, development of that amenity uh, in conjunction with whatever development's allowed to take place. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I agree with that. Hopefully Steve and his client do too. I'm yes, I, I'm not sure if I should be speaking because I know Chris had muted me, but yes, I think all of that, everything that was said is reasonable. Um, we'll, we're looking to do this with due diligence, so the idea of coming up with a reasonable schedule is not a problem. Um, I think, uh, Dennis, your observation that the two um, construction periods are not likely to be the same is also true. I think that uh, homes might be in a normal course uh, built more quickly, but I'm not a contractor, so I can't say that for sure. But we are, we no doubt want to see the clubhouse started and continued with due diligence, meaning you don't stop, you just do, you just keep moving forward with the only uh, limitation being weather or some kind of other, uh, you know, extraordinary event. Uh, so that's the that's what we're prepared to do and to back it up as Rick 
quite act accurately described with a performance bond uh, so that there's no concern about uh, whether or not the developer is going to follow through on this. And Steve, I only, I only muted you because there was a lot of background noise coming from you. I wasn't. Okay. Yeah. I apologize for that. That's um, unfortunately where I am. No, it's fine. That's, that's the only reason I muted you. I don't want you thinking I did okay. it for, for any other reason. No, I just didn't want to speak out of turn. That's all. <laughs> my, it was my virtual ruler. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, um, Dennis, is there anything else in your memo you want to go over? The, or... only, mi the only minor thing is the gatehouse. Uh, in, our, in my opinion, the gatehouse should have been built with Ninninger Road. Uh, Ninninger Road kind of slowly opened, if you will. Um, it was only for construction vehicles at one time. Now it's kind of open. So I think the gatehouse probably should be built. And that shouldn't take uh, much time at all. Uh, so you might want to, uh, I, I recommend that you put that down with your resolution and make sure we get that completed. Can it, you'll, you'll, maybe you don't understand. How come there was never a gatehouse put on um, Ninninger? That's the one I'm talking about. Not on Ninninger, on uh, Thunderbird. Thunderbird, there is, there's a gate there. It's not a gatehouse, but there's a gate there. It's, there is, it's always open. It's not operational. Well, it, it's there. <laughs> Uh, the operate the operations. Uh, I mean, is on the HOA. You can't operate a gatehouse if it doesn't exist or a gate doesn't exist. Right now, it doesn't exist. Uh, the operations. At one time, I know it was working because I used to have to call up every time for the code to get in. Um, but uh, lately, I've seen it open to. So perhaps, Steve, this is something because I would presume uh, the agreement you're you're talking about, and this again is the board is favorable, and I know there'll be some questions about it. We could work that into the agreement that you and Rick and Dennis kind of sit down and capitulate, capitulate and then come back to us with. Yeah, we can, we can talk about that. I, to be truthful, I hadn't really focused on that uh, with my client, but we'll talk about that and roll that into our conversations with, um, uh, with Rick and with uh, Dennis, if, if that's what the board is looking for us to do. Yeah, in, your, in the original resolution, there um, were specifics with respect to both of those entry gatehouses. So we can look back at that and, and just make sure they were not onerous. Yeah. Um, but um, I agree with Dennis that they really should be in fully operational and in place as to what was represented and required under the original resolution of approval. We can certainly take a look at that. It has been a concern for many residents there that the gates were not functioning. So I think that's an important issue for the residents that are, are in there. Now, again, I just haven't had conversations, Robert. I'm not uh, sure what, what the issue is there, but we'll cer I'll certainly look into it for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Sandy, you have any questions, comments, concerns? No. Uh, Rich? I'm good. And Tommy, I think that was an I'm good. You're muted. <laughs> you're still muted. Sorry, you muted me. And I'm good for now. Okay. Um, so I think, honestly, that's where, Rick, I think that's a, the step would be that the three of you would come together, a meeting outside of this meeting, come up with something, and then every you would all come back to, you would come back to us with it for the board to review? Yes. Okay. And I'll provide the board with the resolution materials, which would have the inclusion of the gate requirements in there so that you can see those. Okay. Anything else, Steve? Uh, no, I don't uh, think there is anything else. I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you for your time this evening and coming to the table and, uh, you know, working, working to, you know, work with the board and we appreciate that and look forward to Hearing back from you. Uh, my <laughs> pleasure. I just want to let you know that you can do Zoom meetings from along Interstate 95 in South Carolina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're on one of the cars. Yeah, well, my dad had my dad had two falls within 36 hours, so this oh, son had to hop in a car and go see him. So I'm on my way to Florida now, but I was not going to blow this meeting up. So <laughs> thank you for indulging the background and. We'll, we'll work together. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. My thoughts are with you with respect to your father. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Good night.
All right. Chris? Yes. Um, I'm getting a warning that my battery's just about shot, so I'm going to have to leave the meeting. All right. I'm sorry. You don't, you don't want to join us from your car? Huh? You don't want to join us from your car? <laughs> I guess. I'm not going to have to call yourself. <laughs> Sandy lost power and she's been a trooper tonight and joined via <laughs> cell phone and candlelight. All right. Sorry. All right. It's okay. Thank you. See you, Sandy. Okay. Bye. Good night. We're not voting on anything tonight, so it's. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda is Friedman review and discuss revised site plans for conversion of an existing 1,000 square foot addition of a single family home to be used as a place of worship. Said property is located at 32 Blueberry Lane in Island Mills and is known in the village of Woodbury Tax Maps in 217 Block 2, Lot 4.2. All right. Hey, Mr. Chairman, this is Al Fusco, Fusco Engineering, representing the client. Good evening, sir. Can you just give us the thousand foot overview of the project, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, ba ba basically, it was a uh, single family home that was constructed and the applicants wish to have uh, have a, a thousand square foot addition and on that addition have a shul put in. Uh, we had started it uh, sort of pre-COVID and that sort of delayed the whole project. Uh, we did do some revisions that we sent out in July and uh, we just recently uh, on September 11th got new information back from the planners and or engineers. And uh, we really don't take any exception to those. Uh, we're in the process of completing many of them. Uh, we are going to be asking for, you know, some waivers in relationship to, uh, I believe it's uh, front yard and rear yard and uh, the width of the project. Because when you have uh, two principal uses, you have to have uh, wider and larger areas. And uh, we don't really have that, so we're gonna be requesting waivers instead of variances. Uh, the only item, and we could go through all of the uh, questions if you so wish, but the only one that we uh, see as a um, something we wanna discuss is that it says that we are on um, a corner lot having Blueberry, and I believe the other one is uh, Sky, uh, let me find it here, Skyway. And that's really a 16 foot right of way. It's really not a traveled way. So I don't know that that really is applicable to us or not. But that, other than that, uh, we have some homework to do. We need to get some additional information from our own clients as to usage of uh, you know utilities, it's a, a private well, private septic that we are going to have to certify and or look at expanding depending upon their answers, uh, the amount of uh, you know water they would be using in the Mithka and various other aspects of it. So we're waiting for some information back from the clients, but we hopefully will be able to give you uh, answers to the consultants' questions. We've already answered some of them, but some of them uh, went unanswered and uh, we will be doing it. Like I said, the only exception we have is the corner lot issue. Okay, and with uh, the waivers you're gonna be requesting, if you're gonna be requesting us under substantial burden, you'll need to, uh, with your application, submit a letter of what, what, why it is a substantial burden and why you're looking for the planning board to uh, waive those requirements. We will. Okay. And just so that you know, it's um, Al, and it's clear that um, it's your burden to prove that substantial burden thing. So that's why we ask each applicant to submit a narrative as to why you believe um, that you fit into that substantial burden uh, category in order to qualify for a waiver. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Dennis? Yes, uh, well, 
Abs, uh, Al's identified the fact that he's obviously read the report and he's going to take a look into his client and get back to you. So I'm not going to drill down into all the minor details, but there are just a couple of fundamental issues here that I want to uh, understand. It, the application says an existing 1,000 square foot addition. Existing and addition don't quite jive for me, but I understood that to be an existing 1,000 square foot. Is there any actual construction or addition to the building taking place? Al, do you know? I don't believe so. I believe that they have the addition and they want to convert it into a shul. That's okay. my understanding. That's what I understood yeah. too. So it's existing 1,000 square feet and it says an existing 1,000 square feet to be converted to a shul. But when you, we, we did a tabulation of the areas that have been listed on the plans. And when we do that, the congregation floor area is 2,763 and the residential floor area is 3,027. I'd like, that was the ASBIL plan. If Al, if you could take a look into that and let the board know specifically what areas are going to be for the congregation. I, I did look at that and that does need to be clarified because it was confusing to me as well. I picked this up from one of my other engineers that was working on it. The first time I really delved into it because uh, no one else was available. And uh, I, I, uh, we got sort of last minute got placed on the agenda. So I, I sort of scrambled to you know, get everything put together uh, and I saw that too, and uh, I need clarification from the architect on that as well, because I do have some architectural plans, and I want to delve into those, and we will complete that chart that you started uh, to everyone's satisfaction, so it's very clear. I mean, okay, and when you have that complete, then you can take that and reference back to the parking demands and make sure right. that the parking is addressed adequately as well. Yeah, uh, the other things are mostly on drainage, not drainage, uh, on water and sewer facilities and some minor items that, not minor, they're important items that we always review for any shul that we receive in terms of lighting signs, uh, ARB review, uh, easements, that's, well, easements in particular here. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into those in detail if Al's going to review them and submit a, make an additional submission, unless any of the board members have any questions on the items in the report. Does any of the board any of the board have any questions for Dennis? Yeah, I'm good. Jonathan, uh, <clears throat> you should have re received our report dated October first. I did. And um, I think the, the 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 sort of the mismatch in information in the narrative. In the last time we looked at this, it was the thousand square foot recent addition. I'll call it. It's already there, but it was put up recently uh and it was going to be a thousand square feet but when we got these new floor plans a large portion of the basement uh as well as 1600 feet upstairs so uh it appears from these floor plans that the addition floor space or so-called addition floor space is to be used but also a very large portion of the basement is and other parts of the first floor as well and I also came up with 2,763 as square footage of the shul use by adding together those parts indicated by the architect in the floor plans. And then when you do that, um, you're supposed to do uh, uh, parking spaces, one for every three worshipers or using the square footage method, whichever is greater. And you're supposed to have one per 200 square feet of gross floor area or one per three seats, whichever is greater. So when you use the square footage method, uh, and Dennis noted this as well, uh, you, you get um, and add two parking spaces that are required for the house, 16 spaces would be required is the way it's set up now. So that's, it's quite a different result. Um, now the park, the parking can be weighed by the planning board, but you have to do these, do the calcs and ask for a waiver with and provide reasons why you're asking for it. Uh, if you want to go with that, with that design, uh, in my memo comments, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, you responded by saying, yes, you'll provide that information. Um, so that's good, but uh, 
uh, all of those type that information on landscaping and uh, side and sidewalks and uh, well and septic uh, and so forth will need to be uh, provided. Um, our comment 14, Dennis didn't mention this one, that uh, we see that there's a retaining wall that's inside a right away for the Skytop Drive that would block access to the property at 18 Skytop. And um, in your uh, memorandum, you just said noted. So you're noting that there's that, but I think the board would want an explanation as to, um, you know, how is the 18 sky top, are they going to allow you to, to keep that retaining wall in their, in their easement when, and how will they get to their lot? Uh, if, if so. Um, and those are, those are pretty much, uh, uh, my comments. Thank you, Jonathan. I, uh, one of the things is, uh, is, is I've uh, just taken over this job from one of my uh, other engineers, and I'm going to push this thing through. We had a survey crew out there today uh, picking up a lot of the information that you uh, had identified in your you know, 13, 14, 15, you know, that type of thing. So we, we are working on that diligently, and hopefully we'll get it uh, into you for uh, either next or the that or the round immediately after that so that we can move this thing forward because uh i do want to push this through and and uh make all the changes that you need and one one of the things that is an implication of the parking uh issue when you use the area method or worshiper method whichever is greater it goes by the area of the building it appears that the applicant has reduced the number of worshipers to 12 right in it as a method of lowering their parking requirement uh but given that that won't work in other words if you have a large area of the a, a large right. jewel and you just say you're going to have less people you don't get less parking requirement because it goes by whichever method is greater so if your client it, it, this is an awful lot of space for just 12 worshipers. Um, so given that they're not, given that that park, they can't use that per worshiper calculation, you may want to work with the client and figure out what their capacity, what capacity they really want, what capacity they can achieve with what they've got. And, it's, and um, uh, the, so basically they presented to us a thousand square foot worship space and then came back with uh, almost triple that, but then saying they're going to have less people in it. So uh, I understand the contradictions and yeah. we're going to put a balance between all of this because we're also going to look at, you know, uh, you know, if they're coming in on cars, buses or walking and things of that nature. But I did see that uh, 12 seemed very low to me when I reviewed the file and it did appear that they were doing that for the parking. Uh, based on uh, what you've uh, explained, it's the square footage or the worshipers, whichever is larger, then we might be making a presentation for a waiver and increase the uh, you know, number of worshipers, but look for a waiver based on how they arrive there. So we're trying to get this information out of the clients. Uh, now that I've taken it over, I'll be successful in that because you know, I get very pushy when it comes to trying to get stuff done. So we will okay. be back uh, uh, shortly. So Thank Mr. you. Mr. Fusco, when you do uh, do your narrative, uh, one of the things you're going to have to put in that narrative um, with the use is the transportation modes. Are they going to be walking? Are they going to be using big buses, little buses? So, you know, these are questions that will come from the board at some point. So the more information you can put in that narrative, uh, the better it is for this board and the quicker we can move the process along. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the advice. You're welcome. Okay. Does anybody from the board have questions for the applicant or for Jonathan? I do. Um, Jonathan, in your memo, number five, you mentioned about um, the uh, request for a waiver of, uh, for parking in the front yard. Um, is there any information we have as far as number of cars that they 
Are going to well, be parked in the front? For what the reason, one of the reasons why I glossed over that um, was I said that I had had a discussion with the building inspector in February where he said that Skytop was frontage and that it, this was a double frontage lot. But then I got an email maybe a day or two ago from Dennis's office who had talked with the building inspector who I think had, was making a different determination that Skytop wasn't frontage. So it appears that uh, the building inspector, uh, at some point, he's going to need to write down for this case, you know, what the what the ruling is. But it appears that um, that that sky type right of way isn't really a street, even though it's shown on the tax map. It's really it, it appears that the building inspector will rule that. Sky Top's not a frontage street, and then my comment that they're parking in the frontage won't be will be moot. Uh, and I also understand that the that Mr. Thomas Berger has said he does feel it's two principal uses. And that was another thing I brought up in my memo that the building inspector needs to rule on that, and I I think he will get you that in writing. Okay, thank you. I mean, there that uh, area is surrounded by residential houses too. So uh, I'm just wondering how the rule would apply uh, with parking in the front amongst residential houses. Well, if the building inspector says that the back of the house that faces the sky top right of way, 18 sky top right of way is not a front, then then you can't have a, then it isn't. So we, uh, we have to see how he how he opines. Um, but, uh, the, t uh, typically, I mean, uh, the whole point, if you're going to set up a, a place of worship of this type, people are going to walk to it on the Sabbath and holidays, and you want it to be in the center of a lot of houses, uh, it, uh that by, tra by tradition, by design. Um, that's specifically what you would look for is to put it in the middle of a lot of houses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Jonathan Dennis, the applicant? Anything from you, Rick, on this application? Uh, just briefly, it's uh, should note for the record that it's a type two action uh, under seeker. Um, there was an old uh, GML referral back in February, I think, and there was no response. So you're free to act. And uh, obviously it's not ready for setting a public hearing, but it will require a public hearing. Thank you very much. Any questions for Dennis? Okay, so all right, Mr. Fusco, you're good with your homework and for your next I am. One? I do appreciate everybody reviewing it for me. Thank you. All right, thank you for your time tonight, sir. Thank you. Everybody be safe. You too, Thank sir. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Uh, last item on the agenda this evening, Hadley Farms LLC review application submitted for a proposed shul located within an existing single family dwelling set properties located 47 Hadley Farm Roman Highland Mills and is known on the village wood rate tax map as section 223 block one lot 16.22. Good evening. I think I saw John. Good evening, everyone. Your, your cube new, moved on my screen as people come in and out. <laughs> I don't want to stay on the bottom for very long. <laughs> Good All right, you want to give us the uh, thousand foot? Sure, I'll be I'll be brief. We're uh, we're very early here on this one. Um, we we had given you a basically a, a basic basic I'll say basic submission of the proposed uh, conversion of the. Existing single family residential dwelling at 47 Hadley Farm Road um, into a daily use shul mikta facility. Um, the property is located in the, the R2A zone. It's about 4.3 acres in size. Um, and it is located on the west side of Hadley Farm Road. Um, at the end of Hadley Farm Road and is adjacent to the Woodbury Junction subdivision, uh, which is south of the property. Um, adjacent to Hudson Point and Southfield Falls Roads. Um, the proposed uh, shul and mikvah is designed to accommodate um, of 100 congregants. 
uh, roughly approximately 72 seats for men and 28 seats for um, women. The shul will be used, like I said, on a daily manner, roughly beginning 6 a.m. Uh, till 10.30, 11, uh, 11 p.m. Um, just like our other applications that we've had before the board and familiar, there's typically three services, uh, one at uh, in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one at dusk and sundown um, all year round. We did supply you with a basic site plan that just showed layout for the time being, because there was a couple questions, real significant questions actually, that I wanted to go over with the board. Um, and it consists of really water sewer and access with regards to traffic. So I did get uh, Dennis's and Jonathan's memos. Um, you know, we've I've been, been down this road before with the board with the similar applications. Um, we know we have a lot of work left to do, provide to the board. Um, we need to get updated um, architecturals, you know, floor plans, stormwater, landscaping, lighting. I know all of that will come. We will get to those. Uh, but the biggest questions that I really just wanted to go through the board tonight is the, the project does propose they would like to connect to water and sewer services. And there, the applicant's preference would be to connect into the Woodbury Junction subdivision. Um, if that was possible. I did see Dennis's memo um, regarding we're not in the water district, so that would be an outside user. Uh, and that's something that, that we will pursue uh, as well as sewer. Um, we believe that we can get a gravity service to the Woodbury Junction subdivision uh, rather than having to pump into the force main on Hadley Farm Road. So those are the two issues. And then the third, which is probably the bigger issue is traffic. So most, if not all, of the congregants will be coming from the Woodbury Junction subdivision. They, they will travel via foot now um, and car. So what we didn't want is have traffic flow up Roselawn and turn out to Hadley Farm Road. Uh, it, it's, it's just that. It's basically a glorified driveway. It's a single lane. Um, it's not in any shape, way, or form to take two-way traffic. So the thought was, and basically the sketch that we did was at the end of Woodbury Junction, there is a gate, an emergency crash gate. So that emergency vehicles could come up Hadley Farm Road and get through to Woodbury Junction. We propose to move that gate. So keep Hadley Farm Road closed to through traffic, move the gate, I'll say north and connect our driveway to Hadley Farm Road from that stub road in Woodbury Junction. So that vehicular traffic can come and go through Woodbury Junction rather than coming up Hadley Farm Road, which is where most of the congregation, if not all, will be, will be coming from. Yep. Okay. So if you see on the on the aerial that the chairman has put up there, two of the vehicles parked there uh, just north of South Fall, Southfield Falls Road. Yeah, this is where that gate is, right? Yeah, right. there's a gate. Yeah, there's a gate just north of the, where the car is. We would propose to push the gate just to where the driveway for the neighbor on the right, I'll say, on the east is. And then our driveway would basically follow, you kind of see that dirt path um, that everyone is using for a walking path. Our driveway would follow that arc and then connect up and into the existing existing driveway. Um, so if that is possible, that is, we were proposing for, for traffic. And we would like to further that proposal and design uh, because we do have to approach the town of Woodbury, I believe, because they own the property um, just to the south of this property. So, you know, I and then Dennis's this comment, driveway would go away? That's correct. That's correct. We 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 felt that that proposal left Hadley Farm Road as it was as it was intended, um, and it still closes it for through traffic, but it still allows emergency vehicles to come into um, Woodbury Junction if they had to. Okay. And then site wise, we're proposing a uh, parking areas. Um, that are within the front yard. 
uh, for a total of uh, 34 parking spaces. Um, that is equivalent to what would be required by the code for this. Um, and we would, I was hoping to get an application that we wouldn't have to have a waiver, but it looks like a uh, waiver for parking in the front yard, uh, we would be asking the board to consider um, based on the topography of the site. Uh, it's just best to locate those parking areas in that location and minimizes the grading um, necessary to, uh, to install those. But we're, we're in the infancy of, of the application here. Um, we, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of information to provide you. Um, so tonight is just our, our first introductory meeting. Um, here we are. Thank you. Uh, Dennis or Rick, do you want to weigh in on the, the sewer and the water? It seems to be a, a common topic. It seems to keep coming up now with a couple applications that are outside the consolidated districts. Yeah, they're, they're, they're from what we can tell, they're outside. And um, this is a matter within the province of, I believe, the Village Board of Trustees as to whether they will allow an out of district customer. And if it's well out of area customer, and if it's an out of area customer, I think it might have to be done by an agreement. Um, Rick can talk more about that, but um, that that is, I think John identified the three principal threshold issues which need to be resolved before they can really, you know, you can you can dive into the details, but if you can't resolve these issues, you, you, it's not going to work. So uh, they need water, um, and this is a fairly good congregation they're talking about with a hundred persons. Um, also the time, uh, many of the applicants you have seen for shuls haven't had daily uh, with the hours that this one has. This is a, a full day. Um, this also has certain implications on impacts to the neighborhood with cars and, and movements and that sort of thing and how you might be able to consider that. But in, in talking about the water, they're gonna there's a need for water here and uh, for them, the best thing would be a uh, connection to a, um, a community water supply. Um, whether that's available or not, I'm not sure. As far as wastewater, I'm glad that John mentioned the fact that they'd like to go to a gravity because I noted that there were two force mains going through here, but we really don't like to have people connecting into our force mains. It's just not good practice. And starting that wouldn't be a good idea. So if they can run down the road and connect to the gravity system, it's not that far away, that would be um, better. Now they may have to pump up to that point to, to run by gravity. That would be internal on their property, but they wouldn't be connecting to our, uh, our system in terms of that. Um, and the most difficult I think is the traffic circulation and access. Uh, there's a gate there, but the gate isn't really what's being effective. It's the two giant boulders that are there that are preventing uh, unintended use of Hadley Farm Road. I spoke to Gary about this, and there was originally a gate there so that the ESOs could use that as access if they needed to, to WP3. Uh, what happened was someone kept opening the gate. So they tried to uh, lock the gate. Someone broke the gate then. So after a period of time, they put a couple of, you know, good sized stones there and then the stones got moved. Uh, they were good sized stones and it's not stones, it's small boulders. So now they put two boulders there that, you know, uh, are substantial in size that are not gonna be removed, uh, not without machinery. So whether this is really for ESO access at this point, not necessarily so, but it was supposed to be. And uh, it was supposed to be at least available, okay? And John characterized, I think, Hadley Farm Road very well. Um, when they went down there with the new sewer lines, they repaved it, which was an improvement over what it was, but it's still a very narrow road. I think we might have, uh, John, you may have looked at it more recently that I thought we provided one or two bump, bump outs along the road where a car could pull over and not have to back up the whole road if they met each other coming head on. They could back up to a spot, pull over, and one can pass each other. But that's not a two-way road and it's certainly not designed for, I don't know how the services are run here. Uh, if there's a time when everybody comes and everybody goes or they cross each other, very difficult. The uh, practical aspect would be through uh, WP3. It would be better for the road conditions. However, WP3 are private roads. Uh, this property is not part of WP3. Uh, and I don't know 
uh, even if they could do it, um, the board has to think along with advice from Rick as to, is this a good practice? Because there may be other potential link roads for side connections. And that was not the intent. This was supposed to be a gated community running through uh, gates to come in and out, which we talked about earlier. And um, anyway, it's just a lot of food for thought. Uh, John can proceed. I, I, I don't know who the proficient would have to come from. I suppose in addition to the planning board, it would need to be the HOA who's running the roads and their private roads. Um, but I probably said enough already to get myself in trouble. So I probably should swing over to Rick. <laughs> and uh, there are a number of other small items, not small, like I said, other items, but I think those are the, the, the large issues that need to be dealt with before you really um, dive down into the details. And from some of the things that I've given in my report, these are based upon the prior shul applications you received. They're, I mean, the board is starting to get into maybe a standard mode to certain things you require, lighting going off after services and, you know, to security lighting and that sort of thing. I think that John's got experience with that too. So anyway, that's my report, unless anybody has a question. Good question. Um, and this is maybe be answered by Mr. Queenan. Are members of the homeowner association in in the uh, in the subdivision the the, uh, the same people that are going to be walking and going to the to the shul? In which case, is it a natural addition to their subdivision rather than an outside force using their roads? I, I believe all the congregants will come from WP3. And if that's the case, if the WP3 HOA is the congregation, they can they can amend their documents and uh, as necessary amend their maintenance plan and, and do structure or whatever to include the shul and make sure that any extra traffic or extra extra plowing, extra paving, extra road maintenance would be picked up by the new uh, building. Uh, it's complicated, but if it's all the same people, doable. I, I think the bigger concern is what Dennis was getting at. There's a number of properties that surround WP3 and that if, um, you know, a president, not a precedent, but if the board does it now by allowing an outside property to connect into WP3, what happens if another property owner that's in that big circle says, well, we want to do the same thing, or we want to do the same thing, or we want to do the same thing. So I'm not putting words in Dennis's mouth, but I think that's kind of right. where, he was, where he was going with, with that. So I don't I know. Agree, I agree with that assessment, Chris. It, you know, it's, if you were to consider this, um, I don't think that the basis for your consideration is where some congregates are going to come from. Um, uh, the basis of your decision should be a much bigger land use issue that um, sh should you be allowing not just this, because if you allow this, then there's really little reason to um, start picking and choosing which other uh, new developments wouldn't be able to tie in to Woodbury Junction. So I think you sort of have to look at this that by allowing this to tie into Woodbury Junction, you are essentially um, allowing or have to consider it as potentially allowing many other developments in the future also tying into uh, this development and whether or not that's a good idea from the, the plan that this board had when it was putting in WP3 as a private um, community. Rick, to your point, if, if I could just on that point, um, when this was established, the town of Woodbury at the time took ownership of a strip of land that ran all the way around WP3. They did not at Nininger and they did not at Dunderberg only because they owned the road structures at that time. Right. I'm not sure what happened in Hadley Farm Road here. I'm guessing that strip maybe stayed with the town or maybe it came over. But if, if it's on the extension of that roadway section there, I'm not sure who would own that 10 foot strip. So that just may be another fly in the ointment here that we'll have to resolve, okay? I guess my only point is, is that there's a public purpose perhaps in keeping WP3 isolated like the way it was originally intended. But on the other hand, 
I'm not sure what the public purpose is of keeping the, the shul from getting access in that direction so that it has to go up Hadley Farm Road. What, what purpose that's serving and whether that's an improvement. I understand uh, problems with get, letting them take access from the south or, or letting them go through a process to obtain access from the south. But there's also issues of them taking access from the north. So you kind of, as, uh, I would balance the two. Well, I, I don't think it's a matter of balancing the, um, the ease of the current applicant and their congregants versus the public policy that this board is dealing with generally of how to have movement in and around the village. Right. But the, I agree. They're going to address that at some point. I do want to just briefly address, I don't have, I'm going to have a couple of things that I'll, um, when you call on me, I'll, I'll uh, uh, respond to, but with respect to water and sewer, Dennis is right. It's going to be a board of trustees issue as to whether or not they want to enter into an, an out of district user. I will say I saw in, in our representation of another client, um, the, the town of Monroe planning board that the town of Monroe recently received just very recently received a letter from the Orange County sewer district number one, uh, chastising the town of Monroe Moodna area um, saying that they have exceeded for quite a number of years their capacity um, and that they now are direct and that um, the county has no capacity that it will sell and that therefore the town has to figure out a way to reduce its, its capacity that it's using at the Harriman treatment plant which is quite a trick but um, I think one of the things the Board of Trustees will have to look at, and Dennis will be advising them, is uh, what is the additional capacity that the village has in, under those same Munda Group agreements um, that it has purchased, and realize that that might be very, um, uh, very much a, a, a small commodity that they have to decide how they want to uh, disperse it if in fact it will be many years before the county may allow people to uh, purchase additional capacity. Um, that's actually, that's a great segue, John. There is a new will serve form that this board has put out. It's on the website. It deals with water and sewer. So if you're going to be looking to go to the, the village for that, uh, it is probably something that I want you to look, uh, fill out. I know this board will require it if you go for public water and sewer if that is granted to you. Yes, I did. I, Maria did give me the form. Thank you. Okay. And if I could just clarify, we are not in the water district, but we are in the sewer district, correct? Yeah. Oh, you are in the sewer district? Yep. Okay. Very odd. <laughs> it, it's not... Um, I thought this was it's just It's not outside. typical, but it's not atypical. There are a number of properties around. It's an unusual water and sewer districts. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. But the same thing is true for water. Uh, water, we're not governed by uh, Orange County Sewer District, but we are governed by our available resources in water. And that's something that will need to be considered, again, by the Water Department and the administration. Nope, agreed, correct. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would rather get <clears throat> the connection for this rather than to rely on the well on the property. Well, we're certainly going to pursue the municipal connection and we'll see where that goes. Um, and just and to further your point, Dennis, there is the town of Woodbury does own that strip around, I'll say, I'll say WP3. And they, it's unclear who actually owns this stub of the Hadley Farm Road. So we're in the process of researching that. And I, I'll just according, say, according to the county GIS, it's suburban estate Woodbury. So and it comes back to a Pearl River address. Yeah, that, that is the Hadley Farm road owner. And then this little stub is, I'll say, no man's land. Um, so we're, we have to get to the bottom of who actually owns it. I think my feeling is it's the town, but I'm not 100% sure just yet. Well, it wouldn't be the town, right? Rick, I think. Uh, it goes through would, their strip. I, I, 
I would never say never, Dennis. Um, the only thing that's certain, and the be- one of the beauties of U.S. property law, is that somebody owns every inch of real estate, right? <laughs> so it's just a matter of trying to figure out who owns it, and um, you know, but somebody either by default or by a prior um, failure to do things properly in a record transfer or property transfer, regardless of all those problems, somebody still owns it. And it's just a mystery um, search as to who's going to be able to be the one holding the stick at the end. And so by what, what you put up there, it would appear to blend into the open space running around. That's but perfect. that's, you know, that's a county map. We'd have to take a look further. Okay. I just wanted to point out that because of this connection, that's what makes this property unique is that it really is the only other property that could, or that has a road now and that could directly connect to you know, WP3. Otherwise that strip just runs all the way around the perimeter in varying widths and sizes. Uh, and it does not allow any other connection point into that subdivision. Well, not to be argumentative, but the property opposite on the other side of the street would be similarly situated, I, I expect. But even even beyond, John, um, whether some properties now have easy access to it, um, the same principle would apply if somebody bought up some property and wanted to go ahead and um, create something that would give them access, but for the town and ask the town to go ahead and allow um, access into it. And this planning board isn't I don't think it's going to be guided by what it believes the town will do to protect the integrity of the private development that the planning board um, ruled upon when originally approving this. So I, I think the planning board needs to decide what its plan that it believes is good for the village, regardless of what the town may allow and, you know, abandon certain strips of this. Uh, without the approval, the approval of the village wouldn't be necessary. So I, I think the planning board needs to decide its own chart, charted path. Understood. I was just giving, just giving my two cents. No, and it's good. It's you know, worth more than that, John. <laughs> I'll give you a quarter. quarter. <laughs> the shortage on coins. <laughs> True. No, but I, you know, I rather us talk about this now and get it out early and yeah. work work through it than, you know, at the end. So, um, we'll 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 keep kicking the tires on that. Um, hold on. Before I go back to you, Rick, let me just uh, go back to Jonathan. I know you're patiently waiting in the corner up there. You got a few things in your memo. Um. Uh, I think that. Uh, I don't want to be overly repetitive. We've talked about a lot of topics. Uh, the floor plans, um, it, some of the areas are not labeled and it's unclear which are for the shul and which are for the residents. I think the second floor appears to be entirely the residents, but it's not labeled. So uh, that that's one of the things we haven't talked about. And it, it's similar to the previous um, shul application just need to nail down um, every piece of the floor area of every level needs to be assigned so we can figure out uh, how to apply codes based on the areas used for the shul. Um, and I, uh, I noticed just some, some small errors and figures that need to be reconciled. Also, I had just mentioned that given the large size of the site, it seems like you could uh, set up your parking without um, running it into any uh, required yards where, where parking is not allowed. But uh, but you were saying with topography, you just need to do that. So, but I would encourage you to try and set up conforming parking areas so that it makes it cleaner. You don't need to ask for waivers or variances. Um, <laughs> On my 11, it appears that the the building inspector is looking at the other shul as uh, having one bulk 
standard met for the principal use of the residence and one for the principal use of the shul. So you may need to uh, follow, uh, follow that uh, depending on how that ruling comes out. If I could, Jonathan, th this will not be used as a residence. We'll just okay. giving up so the residential there's, use. There's, there's, okay, so there's no residents. All right. Um, well, that's why I wanted to know what was going on on that second floor, because it's all blank. I thought that that was a residence up there. Yeah, no, I, the, the second floor is actually, there isn't a lot of square footage there. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's almost like the attic of the house. So okay. It's like a basement entry, and then your first floor is kind of your second floor in the front. You know how it's like a basement entry house. So when you get to the second floor, I think there's like a one room up there um, that they're not proposing. I don't think anything to do with that room. But I'll have the architect clean up the floor plans and we'll get everything squared away. But yeah, and you do fine. have a loft up there that's open to down below and it's wide open, but there are a couple of rooms. So yeah, yeah. I think just identify those, what they're yep. used for, storage, whatever it might be. Correct. Okay. And, it, and as far as this whole issue of utility access, road access, uh, wh which direction, whether you can uh, amend the subdivision, uh, I, uh, you know, it'll, you just need to sort of um, explore and, and, and work that out, see how, it, see how it turns out. I wasn't aware of the critical water shortage that would make the district uh, you know, connecting out of the district, a big deal. So uh, I, I just learned that uh, tonight from, from Rick with the uh, mood in the area in Monroe uh, issue. So we'll see how it all turns out. Does, thank you, Jonathan. Does anybody from the board have questions for Jonathan or Dennis? Okay, Rick, I know you said you had a few more things, right? Yeah, just a few. Um, one, it's a seeker type two action, so that should be noted for the record. Um, John, are there any uh, proposed changes to this structure that would require ARB review? No. Approval, the, the outside at all? Nothing's going to be done to it? Nothing, unless we have to uh, put an ADA ramp in, but the building itself would remain. Okay. And finally, um, I just want to you to confirm this. There was something uh, we found online that indicated that this property is presently being used as a Jewish school. Um, is this going to be a school at all, or it's just the shul and mikvah? As far as the applicant has told me, it's shul and mikvah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for Dennis? Oh, Dennis, you, that would be Rick. Sorry. Getting late. Rich? Yeah. Um, Question for uh, John. Um, first floor, if, if they could, you know, in the future, define. There's a room called coffee. I don't know if they're going to cook or what's going to be in there, but uh, if it could be defined, what's going to be done in that coffee room? Also, um, I, I think uh, it was already mentioned by Jonathan. Um, I like to see square footage of each room. He did about two rooms, but not all of them, um, just so we could see the total square footage, uh, you know, label. And then uh, the basement. The bathroom, six by nine, seems rather small for the maximum capacity. Um, I would question that, the size of that bathroom, looking at the, uh, the, the capacity for that building. So... Uh, I mean the the one bathroom that in the basement they had. Yeah, it looks. <laughs> I mean, looking at the capacity, look at the size. I would say you know it's rather small. Okay, we will look into that. I'll the architect detail that up. Anything else for the applicant or for our consultants? Okay. All right, John. I think you're you're good with some homework for now. Oh, yeah, I got plenty to do. Okay. Uh, anybody else have anything tonight? Good. All right. Well, Good. John, thank you for your time. And uh, I'll offer a motion to close. You make we'll that make second motion. All right, Claudia, pick whoever you want. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank okay. you. All right. Thanks. Thanks.